Okay. Welcome to Supply Chain TV, the SC. Today, um, I am going to be your host. My name is Irina Roska. I am the Director of Supply Chain Operations at Helix, um, a DNA company, so go check us out. I also um, write a few supply chain blogs on Sustain SCM, and I will look forward to interacting with everybody there. Um, and today, I'm super excited to host a conversation with Benny Andrade. He is the Senior Logistics Manager at Dr. Bronner's. So I'm going to turn it over to him because um, he's got a ton of exciting stuff to tell us. Hi, hi. Thank you for having me. Uh, really excited uh, to talk supply chain logistics, sustainability, fair trade, and what Dr. Bronner's is all about, right? Um, so, Dr. Bronner's is the number one uh, soap in the natural market space, and uh, we've been in business for a few years now. The Bronner family started making soap back in the mid-1800s in Germany, and it's been a long journey, as you can tell, and now this is the fifth generation of Bronner's making soap here now in California, Southern California, and for those who don't know, we're based in Vista, California, San Diego County. Yep. Awesome. So that must put some interesting dynamics in your supply chain based on your location. Why don't you tell us a little bit more of sure. um, kind of what your global supply chain looks like? Right. So uh, like I mentioned, Dr. Bronner's is a soap manufacturing company, uh, pretty much toiletries. Uh, we uh, basically do uh, liquid soap, bar soap, uh, lotion. Some right here. Space. There we go. Exactly. And our number one sellers are 32 ounce uh, peppermint. This is a sample of the peppermint. This is the four ounce uh, size. But uh, our number one seller, I mentioned, 32 ounce. So we do have a lot of challenges. We source about 80% of our raw materials from abroad. So meaning that we have to coordinate, orchestrate, and communicate with a lot of countries and a lot of vendors and a lot of suppliers around the world. The challenge is that we just don't pick up the phone and call 1-800 raw materials and, you know, magically they appear. Um, we are a fair, uh, fair trade certified company. We are a organically certified uh, company, among other 18 or plus um, certifications that we have. We don't test in animals. We are kosher. We are... Um, you know, sustainable. So we uh, really live by those certifications and that's what our customers have been demanding and we, you know, respond to our customers. So why do we source the majority of the goods uh, from abroad? Because there's no supply here in America that have to meet the organic certification, the fair trade certification. So our basic ingredient in most of our um, products is coconut oil. So coconut oil, we don't grow here in America. We grow it in subtropical countries. So we source a coconut oil from our sister company in Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is an interesting project that we started back in 2005. So we went in there as a relief program after the tsunami that hit 2005, 2006, the uh, South Pacific. So we wanted to help uh, the communities because what do you see when you have natural disasters? And let me give back a little bit. Um, shareable donations and being a company that cares for community is in our DNA. Our company was founded actually as a religious non-for-profit organization by Dr. Bronner's. We're not religious. We're not uh, any type of sect or anything like that. But definitely giving back to the community is in our DNA. So going back to Sri Lanka, we went in there, and what you see when, when major natural disasters hit, we have a lot of uh, media coverage and a lot of money is pouring in trying to help the communities. But then, you know, after a couple of weeks, you know, it gets boring for the media, and then, you know, they leave, and they, unfortunately, you know, the community still have to, you know, go to work and uh, sustain their families. And this is the real challenge with something like this happening right? Yes, we send water. Then Yes, we send money. Yes, we send clothing. But what people really want is just get out on their feet and, and, and get on with their lives. So we want to help the fishermen to fix their boats. We want to help the carpenter to fix his um, shop. So what we did, and we found this um, old coconut mill, and we thought, well, why don't we, you know, pour in some money there and help them to, you know, build this or renovate or develop this uh, mill. And uh, 
uh, that way we can employ uh, people in the community. And that's how it all started. Um, 10 years, 13 years after, Sorrento Paul, which is the name of the company, is the number one coconut oil uh, food grade organic and fair trade certified company in the world. So these are the type of projects that we engage and that you can imagine. And yes, after 10, 15 years, there's been a lot of challenges in, in order to do that because we want to take care of our communities. And overall, what it is, is accountability. Making sure that the raw materials that we're sourcing are organically certified. Um, and again, fair trade certified. But what does that mean? It means that uh, we want to make sure, first of all, that there's no child labor involved. Second, that our vendors and suppliers get paid fairly for their raw materials above the minimum wage and above uh, market prices. So that way, that residual income goes back to the communities, right? And really, you start that engine going on and again and again. And what we did, and we found this uh, project to be the the stepping stone and the benchmark for the rest of the projects that we have around the world. Similar situation with um, olive oil, which we have a, a good partner. It's not vertically integrated with us in Palestine. Uh, palm oil in Ghana. And as many of you guys know, you know, you know there's a lot of challenges and, 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 and not being truthful on what's happening in the palm oil supply chain around the world. We did not want it to be associated with that story. So we went into Ghana where there's you know, no orangutans uh, losing their environment um, and also being sustainable, organically sustainable. So we teach and we train the farmers to practice organic practice, uh, yeah, uh, practices and in order for them to really have a commitment uh, with the community and with the company that they're selling the products. So same project, we replicated in, in Samoa for coconut oil again. And each country, of course, uh, has so many challenges, right? Uh, cultural challenges, uh, language barriers, um, political sometimes, land uses. So all of that is what we face and bringing all the raw materials into this one single manufacturing source uh, or location for us here in Southern California. Yeah. What a fascinating supply chain. That, that sounds amazing. So, um, I mean, you gave us some really good examples of some of the challenges and some of the really great partnerships that, you know, obviously you've been able to forge over the years. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you, can you give, give us a little bit more information um, as to how does Dr. Bronner's really know um, or try to understand and keep track of what's going on at what we would call the bottom of the pyramid um, mm -hmm. of your supply chain? So mm -hmm. how deep um, do you guys keep data on? How deep do you do analytics? How hands-on are you with these things? Tell us a little bit of the story behind that. Right. Um, so first of all, what what you just mentioned is very, very important, right? And uh, Dr. Bronner's, though, we've been making soap for, you know, over 150 years. Um, the business has grown tremendously in the last 10 years, right? So we are learning also uh, you know, on our way, and we're trying to professionalize areas in where we want to develop, um, you know, the, the, the potential of our employees for sure. For instance, I was the first external hire of Dr. Bronner's, and I'm closing into eight years uh, with the company. So that tells you that, you know, within the last eight or 10 years, the professionalism within the company has, you know, exploded tremendously. So back to your supply chain challenge question and what do we do to communicate and have transparency? And that's what you're looking for, transparency and accountability. Um, knowing our suppliers. And I think we, well, we take pride, not only saying we take pride and know of this, that we know and shake the hands of our suppliers through our supply chain. So that gives you uh, a lot of power, a lot of uh, pride in how do you do your work? So how we track our information, how do we track all of this documentation certification, because this is important for us because we're telling to the public, our products are organic, our products are fair trade. And every single document and information is right there, okay? I'm gonna just give you an example of our palm oil supply chain. 
Palm oil is only used in our um, bar soaps that we manufacture in the East Coast for now. We also uh, manufacture uh, bar soaps here, but all the soap base, the, uh, the noodles that we use to press the bar are manufactured in the East Coast. So palm oil has to go through a refining process in the Netherlands. So we ship from Ghana to the Netherlands, which about takes 35 to 40 days, depending on you know, what type of chipping line and vessel you're using. Um, after that, about a, you know, three, four days to clear custom, deliver it into uh, the refining facility in Rotterdam. And then after that, that it's refined, loaded into isotankers, and then shipped into the East Coast, uh, to the ports of New York. And after that, clearance, then we deliver it to our customers. Not before, we have to heat it up to 150 to 175 degrees so it can be fully melted and liquid and into production. So that's only one material that we use. And similar with coconut oil that we bring, like I mentioned, from Sri Lanka, olive oil from Palestine, jojoba oil from the desert of Arizona and Israel as well, so on and so forth. So how do you track that information? How do you track all this uh, craziness that we talk? It is our longest supply chain, and it's, it's difficult to orchestrate and bring all these containers at the same time. So you have to partner with, with strong uh, providers and strong vendors. We really rely on our freight forwarders. We rely on the trucking companies and the uh, shipping lines that they hire as well. We keep a strong relationship and communication constantly with all of our uh, intermediate vendors, like our refining process uh, vendors, like our uh, boots on the ground at Ghana, right? So we do keep uh, information uh, based on our TMS, based on databases that internally have been developed. And we have an in-house uh, programmer and developer that has been helping us in develop uh, developing our own software so we can you know maximize those uh, those capacities that we have in terms now on the chipping side when we bring the raw material we process the product and then we chip out our, our finished product so um, I will say you know in a nutshell is one accountability traceability transparency and uh, and strong relationships I always say one of my business mentors uh, taught me this that we are all in the business of relationships right? So uh, I always keep that in mind. Absolutely, and I think that you know that's obviously that much more important when you're talking about supply chain. And um, one of Sarah's favorite things to say, who is a regular host of this um, show, um, she says that collaboration is the future of business, and that I mean that's so true. Um, and especially in the type of situation that you just described, where truly the reputation and the brand of Dr. Bronner is in any marketplace that, that, that sales happen, um, that's a commitment to the consumer. And um, everything that happens in the background, um, you know, helps fulfill that commitment or not. So um, that's, that's, that's so fascinating. Right. So um, as you, you kind of discussed a little bit about some of the partnerships in terms of the transportation and the overall supply chain, um, I know that there have been a lot of different third party organizations that are wanting to help businesses create a benchmark system, help them, um, you know, with resources into how to implement a more sustainable approach to their supply chain. Can you tell us a little bit about some of these organizations like um, you know, B Corp or anybody like that, that has been a good resource for you and that you would recommend others who are wanting to embark on the same journey um, to take a, you know, take advantage of. Right. So, uh, yeah, great that you mentioned. We are a B Corp certified organization. We probably are the largest in volume uh, B Corp certified organization in uh, Northern Hemisphere. We are the largest manufacturing plant uh, organically certified and um, fair trade certified at the same time in, in the Northern Hemisphere. So we relied on this third party's uh, certifier. Um, it, it will be just you know not truthful that we just claim ourselves to be the best of the best if someone else is not you know proving that and vetting that. Um, for example, the the organic certification throughout the years have been 
know, many changes, many challenges, uh, including our CEO, David Bronner, has been in the forefront in the fight of companies that are not truthful claiming the organic certification. And this is true, or, you know, that back in the day when organic, let's say natural, uh, blew up, a lot of companies will just take a, a, a tea size of organic lavender, and then we'll just dip it into their uh, lavender soap batch, and uh, they will claim to be organic because they use, you know, organic lavender. And there was no accountability. There was no regulatory uh, body that will say, no, that's not true. Or yes, you're 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 doing the right way. So we fought, and and, and David Bronner and Bronner family and, and and all of our industry partners have been fighting and fighting and, and fought this uh, to uh, so that the government can adopt some sort of guidelines, right? So the USDA under the FDA said, okay, these are the guidelines of you know what can you call organic, right? But I'm not gonna certify you. I'm not gonna vet you. So you follow this. So it's within the industry that industry partners got together and they said, okay, we want our customers to really believe us and we want someone else to vet us and not just us or the government, right? So that's how this organization came and in, in, uh, um, you know, put together and they're certifying organic uh, certification, like for us, uh, in our case, is Otico, um, Oregon Tilt, but there are other uh, third-party organic certification, IMO for Fair for Life and Fair Trade certification, and like you mentioned, B Corp, right? So B Corp, we, we're certifying, what it means is that we're, we're, we're telling everybody that uh, if more investors are coming into the company of the organization, in our case, they probably won't. But in case the investors say, you know what, I don't want to donate to that cost. I just want my money and you should pursue the profits. We're not entitled to that, right? First, we want to take care of our people and their charitable organizations that we are committed to and that we're not only chasing the buck, right? We are for profit business. We want to make uh, profits, of course, and we want to do better every year. When I joined the company in 2011, the company closed uh, with about $45, $48 million in sales. Last year, we closed with close to $120 million. So in the lapse of seven, eight years, we've almost, you know, you know, grew 300%. So that's a lot of challenges as well in managing growth, right? Uh, and this is the nature of the organic market. 20, 25 years ago, um, only a few stores were out there selling organic and natural product. But now they, that is more mainstream, or organic market, natural market is mainstream. You find organic products in your, you know, around the corner, um, you know, retail store, grocery store, and you don't necessarily now have to go to, you know, the typical uh, or the traditional natural organic markets uh, or your co-ops. So uh, the market has changed and definitely we've benefited of that. And uh, you can find our products uh, accessible for, for the consumers at pretty much everywhere, right? So um, we, we rely, again, uh, completely on our third-party certifiers. And if you go to our website, uh, you'll see all the information from the different certifications that we have. And talking again about that growth and managing managing that growth, uh, we have an in-house person uh, that coordinates all these efforts. And, and that's how important it is. We have a position that the um, certification and licenses and I think accountability, I'm not exactly what her position is, but in the nutshell, uh, she manages um, all the certification and licenses for Dr. Brock. So uh, that's how committed we are in really telling the truth to our customers. Awesome, that's a lot of really great information. So um, two really important things that you brought up there um, that I really would love for everybody to take away from this conversation is that committing to a sustainable approach and a, a just a, a, 
a good impact approach um, doesn't necessarily mean that you have to leave revenue on the table. And so the fact that you highlighted um, the amount of growth that Dr. Bronner's has been able to attain over the past few years while self-imposing more regulations is, is very important. So thank you for, uh, for saying that. And then part of, uh, you know, to your point, there is a lot of competition in this market um, and, and, and a lot more that's coming up. And so um, it is worth understanding, you know, is everybody who's becoming competition um, doing the same level of rigorous um, testing and um, due diligence in their supply chain to ensure that everything that they're claiming is in truth correct and not partially there? Um, so just everything for everybody to be aware of that, um, you know, to your point, these um, regulations and audits and everything else are, are self-imposed and there is no regulatory body that is going to come in and say, no, this is not true. So a lot of these claims don't necessarily always stem from the same commitment that you guys have brought to the table. Correct. And, uh, and again, it, the challenge is that we want to source 100% organic, and that's our first hurdle for us, right? And everything has to be organic. There's, there's no, uh, you know, wiggle there. Fair trade, uh, of course, we want to source as much as possible. But like you said, there's, there's challenges for business to go in fair trade because they will say, well, uh, am I going to make a buck if I go fair trade? If the, the market's there, the buyers are there. So, when we want to source, uh, for instance, you know, an essential oil that is organic, but there's no uh, fair trade certified raw material of this product. So what we do is that we tell the regulatory body um, saying we, we couldn't find any fair trade, uh, you know, certified essential oil with whatever the fragrance is. And uh, we had to buy it only organic and then they will approve this. And, but like you said, self-imposed, we pay a premium to the fair trade uh, organization and where that premium, 10%, goes back to the communities and they decide uh, uh, with the board um, how they distribute that money, right? So like you said, I mean, a lot of companies will say, well, I'm not going to go in that direction because I'm losing a lot of money. Um, but we don't see it that way because the way that we see it in where you communities are going to, you know, uh, be able to buy products to really get ahead of themselves is to developing infrastructure, um, give them the, giving them opportunities to the marketplace and uh, being competitive with their products. Otherwise, you know, big corporation, you know, will just, you know, block them and really don't have access for, to them for the marketplace. So you mentioned something very important, being sustainable and engaging in this type of practices. Sorry about that. It's not necessarily just leaving the buck on the table. Um, you can make money, of course. And I understand, I've read books about, you know, prominent uh, scholars in terms of sustainability that if it's not profitable, well, I'm not gonna do it. But we need the companies also to sometimes make a sacrifice, but also find a, a profit within uh, their supply chain. Um, we are doing this because we really care for the environment, for our communities, our suppliers, our employees. But you know, in the great scheme of things, you know, we're a small company, right? Mm -hmm. But if the Amazons of the world or the Walmarts of the world or the big organization corporations make a tiny change in their supply chain, that's a huge impact in sustainability, right? So uh, we only run a couple of trucks in our um, commercial fleet uh, only to support our, our production needs and transfer and all that. And we try to be, you know, as much as sustainable and less carbon footprint on that while we also track our carbon footprint with our rest of our um, suppliers and tra transportation companies. Will you imagine, you know, if, if, if this big corporation say, well, we're going to go fully electric trucks in 2030, that will be a huge impact in, in, in the supply chain, right? So we need, yes, those small changes, but we need the big guys also to make small changes as well. That's, that's a very fair... Um Fair point, and I think that that you know it's obviously it's important. And the more changes happen, 
from, mm -hmm. you know, for both, you know, two reasons, right? Like there's the, the small organizations that can push a change and then there's the big organizations that can push a change. And um, I, you know, I'm, I'm encouraged by the smaller organizations, as you said, that are so committed um, mm -hmm. the way that you are. And so that's awesome. Um, as we kind of get to a close, I do want for you to maybe just very um, quickly walk us through what's, what does it take for you to, so this is your toothpaste. Right. Um, and this is this is your soap, um, and it's liquid soap, so that everybody knows. Um, walk us through what does it take to put these new products on the market? So, if, like when you put this toothpaste, right? So your core competence is in um, the palm oil, and it's in the soap and everything else. So, mm -hmm. how do you even go about sourcing all the ingredients for this and making sure that this comes to the same standards as this and as your bar soap? Right. So, uh, talking about the liquid soap, which you know is our number one seller, um, you can see it's, it's a multi-ingredient product that uh, are coming, like I mentioned before, around the world. Bringing the materials is a challenge. Uh, and talking about sustainability, you know, you will say a lot of our customers will call us. Well, why are you guys are using plastic? Right. Still, um, well, you know, you, you you do your best. Right. You see in all the ingredients that we do that we use for our products and all the great projects that we have around the world and the impact really that we, we make uh, sourcing those materials from the places that we source it. And we doing a lot in sustainability. As a matter of fact, the plastic that we use for our bottles is PET, post-consumer plastic. So this plastic already had a life and it's having a second life, right? Not only that, our product is three times more concentrated that your average soap, which means if you leave a, you know, a glass of soap and, uh, on the, under the sun and you leave this other conventional brand, and it will evaporate, the water will evaporate, but you'll see three more times of Dr. Bronner's soap concentrated there, which also means that it will take three times more to uh, you know, get through the whole bottle of your soap. So meaning that you're using less plastic at the end of the day, right? So what does it take? Obviously, we like to see each other not only like an engine, but, on, but an organism, really, because the multi-departments that work within Dr. Bronner's have to communi communicate and relate to each other every single day. So um, production obviously takes pride of making the product, uh, supply chain logistics of bringing the raw materials but also marketing and sales and putting these products over the shelves, right? Um, we have a very strong sales department across the country. The uh, director of sales and the senior director of sales, national senior director of sales, they're not in the same office. They're not in the same building. Uh, Mark DeRose, our director of sales, is here in Vista, and our national sales director is in Colorado. And under her, uh, we have a very uh, strong network of uh, regional sales manager across the country that communicate and know the local markets and understand the different needs. So our product goes through, main, uh, mainly through distributors that distribute to the uh, organic and natural uh, stores or not natural, right? Um, so our product leaves uh, Southern California to closely to 24 to 30 distribution centers across the country for though for two particular distributors, very well-known um, uh, brands uh, in the natural space. But we also are in the more conventional and um, mass market retail stores like you know, Walmart, Target, Costco's including. So those go directly to uh, to the stores or the, their distribution centers. So we coordinate, our department coordinates with our shipping managers, with our uh, international and shipping managers, uh, where and how, what it, what it takes to send all those um, um, those pallets of soap to the, to the marketplace. Now, I also have to mention that about 20% of our sales are from international sales. So we have a very strong presence in the international market. And the way we work in the international market is a couple of ways. One is through our sister company in German, Dr. Bronner's Deutschland, that they sell uh, through into um, continental Europe. So everything that sells in Europe goes through Dr. Bronner's Germany. Once that account or that particular uh, country hits a certain level of sales, 
it becomes a direct account from Dr. Bronner's USA. So that way we don't have to, you know, drop ship from to Germany and then from Germany ship there. And we've gotten there with a few accounts now with um, France, uh, Switzerland, uh, the Netherlands, and I'm missing probably. And the other model is to have an exclusive distributor, right? That they are the exclusive distributor for Dr. Bronner's products and merchandising. And, uh, and this you know, model uh, has worked amazingly great. Our major international market is Korea, followed by Japan. And we have to listen to the international markets, right? Which are very different in how we act and distribute our products here and sell our products to the customer. Um, Dr. Bronner's doesn't invest in traditional marketing uh, schemes like, you know, billboards or glossy magazines or stuff like that. We want to redirect our marketing investments into more, uh, you know, mouth to mouth or to community engagement and grassroots projects, festivals in where we really engage with, uh, with the communities and the users of our product. Now, if you go to Japan, Korea, um, it's, it's quite different, right? I'm just putting those two examples. The organic market there has grown or started growing in the 1990s as a more of a premium and, and, and maybe luxury item, right? So you have to perceive it like that. The Japanese market perceives it like that. The Korean market perceives it like that. And they're all about the skin, Right? And they're very particular of that and the products and the organic portion of it. So each market really looks into what it is important for them. Right? For example, Europe, because they've been, they're probably years ahead of us in terms of organic. Well, they expect that the products are organic. So what is that makes Dr. Brown differently from other products? Well, the fair trade portion of it, the saving uh, the environment. We go to our uh, neighbor down south, Mexico. They really t uh, put emphasis on the environment portion, right? So it, it's a little bit different, the approach to the, to the marketplace. And, uh, and again, the challenges are still there. But I will say for me, um, uh, the outbound is easier <laughs> than bringing all the raw materials. For me, it's like, yeah, that's, that's easy, you know? We just chip it out there. And obviously, there's, there's a lot of work in between, you know, sending our product and delivering our product, uh, I'm not, you know, minimizing anything. But uh, the work that our sales department, marketing department, and PR departments do are very important to communicate what we really want to say. So if you guys seen our label, it has about 3,000 words. We have a lot to say. <laughs> so uh, uh, read the labels. And as uh, some people say, um, it's a great bathroom reading material. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Um, so yes, I actually have seen a lot um, from you, uh, a few different flavors that kind of match the demand of the international market, um, which has been fascinating. So um, super appreciate that background. Um, in conclusion, why don't you just tell us what has been maybe your favorite experience in working uh, with Dr. Piranha's, your favorite project? Um, what do you like really take pride in in having uh, materially changed there? over your, I mean, a very extensive career with the company now. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so um, I really love and enjoy working with my coworkers. Um, trying to mentor my direct reports, definitely it's been, it's been a, you know, greatest honor within the company. Um, being so close with the uh, upper management team and, and the Bronner family, Bronner family is here working every day. Right, uh, Mrs. Bronner. The in the CEO. office, right there with you? Not there, here with me, but in the building, <laughs> in the vicinity of the building. Uh, but Mrs. Bronner, the CFO, who's mother of, of David Bronner, our CEO, CEO, and Mike Bronner, our president, um, she's here every day at 7 a.m. in the morning and leaves the company at 6, 7 p.m. So she's one of the most hard workers that I've ever seen. And that inspires me, right, really. And another thing really that I, I really take pride and I really enjoy this is getting to visit our, our, our projects in Sri Lanka. You know, going to the source, like I mentioned before, shaking the hands of the farmers where you source the coconuts 
that will eventually go to the coconut meal and that will eventually go into ourselves. It really, really makes a difference and appreciate what you know your tier one, tier two, three, tier three suppliers do for you. At the end of the day, you know we have to understand that our uh, you know supply chain is taking care of you know our supplier suppliers um, as well as our customers customers. If you want to go to the uh, basic definition of supply chain, right? But that is one of the most, for me, important moments uh, of, of my career here. And, uh, and, and, and I hope to go back. I've been there twice and I've been fortunate to do that, taking the teams there and visit and interact with our Serenipal team, but also interact with the, with the modest people and the humble people that really help us to, um, to, to put this product to everybody out there and there are the um unsung heroes awesome that's that's amazing um i'm jealous i wish that i could have that type of impact uh but i um you know i'm lucky to have a friend like you that teaches me about stuff like once thank you um awesome well benny thank you so much for being with us today um obviously everybody go check out dr bronner's so that you can learn about their um, sustainability and their um, impact. Their the information on their website about this is fascinating, and so um, you know most supply chain professionals should be thinking about stuff like this. Um, and you know it's obviously something super exciting for all of us to embark on. So again, Betty, thank you. This has been uh, a pleasure, and I'll be looking to speaking to you soon. Thank you very much, and I appreciate the invite, and uh, I hope to see you soon. And lastly, um, our company uh, motto and actually our corporate name is All One. And uh, for everybody, All One means something different. And lastly, I want to turn the table here. I want to ask you, Irina, what, what's, what does All One mean to you? Oh, wow. That's uh, put me on the spot. All One. Um, I mean, I think that when I, so sustainability is really important to me, obviously, and being in supply chain. Um, I think that we have, you know, we're, we're right at the front of being able to, to make those changes and make those positive impacts. And, and to your point, um, the, big, the bigger the organization, the bigger the impact and the more positivity we can create. And so to me, All One just really means how do we think about everyone when we make these types of decisions. Um, as a business, as an individual, it doesn't really matter because, you know, you guys are a small organization, but your impact matters, right? So I'm one individual, my impact matters. Um, and, and that's really, that's what that means to me. And so that's why I was so excited about having you on today because, you know, your efforts just are, um, should be replicated by everyone. All one. <laughs> Thank you, Rina. Thanks, Benny. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thank you.